So to kind of begin, I want to go over and I'm going to start off in Romans um, to kind of look at the word perseverance, um, which is kind of to a certain extent um, a word that we use to kind of describe what Stephen is doing in the midst of all of this. Um, and definitely a lot of the apostles, like this is a word that we that we ascribe to Christians who have led difficult lives as a result of the faith. And I just kind of want to want to encapsulate what this word actually means versus how we tend to think about it from a worldly um, definition that you would find in the dictionary. And not only that, but we also glory in tribulations, knowing that tribulation produces perseverance. So perseverance here in Romans, Romans 5, 3 is kind of this idea of, and Lexi like encapsulated this like almost perfectly earlier, and I'm just like, this is this is awesome. This is why she needs to be here. Um, but it's this idea that perseverance is an active trust in a hope for something that is coming. Having that hope, having that trust in that hope is what enables endurance to occur. So perseverance is not endurance alone or just getting through something. Perseverance is getting through something because you have hope in something greater that is coming. And so with that, I want to focus um, kind of our time tonight looking at kind of what, what is perseverance, what is its relationship to hope, and what can we learn about those kinds of things as we look at part of Stephen's speech and his death. We see perseverance, which, is, which again is this hopeful endurance throughout this whole section of scripture from Acts 6, 8 to 7, 60. We see Joseph, the son of Jacob, the father of the 12 patriarchs, the father of the 12 tribes mentioned. He is someone who persevered through great trial. Moses persevered. The people of Israel as a whole persevered. Abraham persevered. An essential component to life with God is perseverance. So how do we actually persevere? How do we have this trust and hope that enables us to endure? How do we endure? To answer these questions, I think it's important to really hone in on the end of Stephen's life, which is what allows us to see why our hope in Christ is so vital for our perseverance. Starting in verse 51 of chapter 7. You stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears, you always resist the Holy Spirit. As your fathers did, so do you. Which of the prophets did your fathers not persecute? And they killed those who foretold the coming of the just one, whom you now have become the betrayers and murderers, who have received the law by the direction of angels and have not kept it. When they heard these things, they were cut to the heart, and they gnashed at him with their teeth. But he, being full of the Holy Spirit, gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God and said, Look, I see the heavens open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. Then they cried out with a loud voice, stopped their ears and ran at him with one accord. And they cast him out of the city and stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their clothes at the feet of a young man named Saul. And they stoned Stephen as he was calling on God and saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Then he knelt down and cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not charge them with this sin. And when he had said this, he fell asleep.
We endure by our expectation and hope in the promise of Christ, which is everlasting life with God. John 3, 16. So many other scriptures, so many other passages talk about the reality of this life that continues on after the physical death of the body because of the promise of God in his son. So how do we persevere? How do we grow in this thing that the Bible talks about that's perseverance? In this ability to actively endure by looking to Christ and everlasting life with God. We grow in this by undergoing trials and tribulations, whether that be persecution from those around us who may or may not be in the church. There, there is no guarantee that the people you sit with in the pews on a Sunday are actually in the body of Christ. There is no guarantee of that. We grow in this by studying God's word and meditating on the scriptures. Um, if you want to know more about that, you should probably ask Tucker about Hebrews 4.12. We can talk about it a lot better than I can. We grow in this by renewing our minds so that we are focused on God and the things of God. We grow in this by becoming more devoted and pious in our relationship with God. This is something that I suck at. Growing in these areas, you know, keeping my focus on Christ, keeping my focus on the hope that is Christ. I can't telling you guys tonight what the absolute best way to do this is because I don't know. I don't have this perfect and full understanding of what that looks like. But what I do have is I have the things that I failed at. I have my own failures and I have an example to look to, which is Christ, and in this case, is Stephen. I have the scriptures. And so to kind of focus in on some of this and my own failures, I want to I really focus on verse 55. But he, being full of the Holy Spirit, gazed into heaven, and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. I can count on one hand the number of times in my life that I can actually say that I looked up to God with something that I would call true hope. I think more often than not, when I look up to God, when I cast my eyes upward towards the heavens, it's in desperation. It's in frustration. It's in anything but what we would call hope. And yet, Stephen, who looks so much like Jesus in this moment, is casting his eyes upward and he sees the glory of God. And it was because he was full of the Holy Spirit. It's because he was fully submitted to God's will for his life. But he didn't get to that point in one minute or one second. He got to this point after a lifetime. 
in chapter six earlier before we get to the part that we have read it, Stephen is called up as a deacon. He is called up as someone who has lived a life of obedience to God, who is set over the finances for individuals within the church. He's someone who knew the scriptures. And he is someone who was devoted. He was someone who truly loved God. And so when he looked up into heaven, he saw God. He saw the end of his hope. He saw the reason that we all chose Christ. That, that opportunity, the chance to be in God's presence for everlasting eternity. When I was a freshman, a sophomore, here at SMU and earlier in my life, my hope was in what I could do. My hope and my trust was in my own abilities, what I could do for, to provide for myself and my own individuality, my own sense of self, my own sense of identity in who I was. My hope and trust was in an idol I had made out of myself. And when I think back on that in comparison to what so many of you have already said about Stephen, I can't, I can't help but laugh because, and or cry, um, we'll see which way it goes. Um, because the world celebrates self-idolatry. The world around us says that doing things your own way, that doing things the way that you want to do them is how to enjoy life. But what the scriptures seem to say, what the scriptures seem to speak to, is this idea that you don't actually enjoy life unless you're looking at God in every moment of life. So that our hope is what allows us to endure. And so I want to finish um, these last couple of minutes talking through something that I think a lot of us in our age group kind of struggle with. It's, it's this Christian understanding of death. Um, and to, to kind of help me do that, I'm pulling from Samuel Willard. Um, he was a Puritan pastor during the colonial days of American history. And I'm kind of emphasizing a lot of his points with things that we can see on a surface level, um, kind of first two, three levels of exploration of scripture. And so these were kind of his four points that help us have an understanding of what it means to live a Christian life with that correct hope, and ultimately what it means to die as a Christian. But the purpose of a Christian is first to draw close to God, and second to complete the anointed call upon his life. Stephen was a believer who was recognized for his obedience and was killed for his obedience. And in his perseverance, in his trusting and hoping, continued to obey the work of the Spirit in his life and in his heart, such that God was glorified. But the value of a Christian the value of a child of God is such that both his life and death have an honor 
and a value bestowed and imparted to them. And this next piece is I would say something that is said very carefully. Because the scriptures do talk about this difference between being a child of God and the value of that, of that living, of living that way, being different from the value of living without being a child of God. Those are two different values in scripture. And Samuel Willard sums them up in a way that, honestly, I kind of read it by teeth the first time I read it, because he words it as an honor and value that is above those who do not know Christ. Um, that, was, that took me a lot of unpacking to understand how he was getting to that statement. But Stephen was a believer. In his trial, he was recorded as having the face of an angel. The people who were condemning him, who were looking at him, saw the face of an angel. There are some scholars who have argued that we can understand an implication from this verse that in his sanctification, in Stephen's sanctification, God allowed him to have a presence in that moment that was perceived as being equivalent to that moment that should God allow it that in our sanctification people can see us as a more purified reflection of Christ. That the sanctification of a Christian is tied to their very salvation. Stephen being recognized as a deacon in, earlier on in chapter 6 is it's evidence of that sanctification process that does not begin until one is saved. It's recorded that he was, he was one of the seven wisest men in all the Jerusalem church. The value of a Christian's death and experience is twofold for the furthering of sanctification and for the results of honoring and glorifying God. In his dying, Stephen saw God and in so doing cried out the glory of God. Seeing God in the moment of death, seeing the realization of our hope is sanctification. It, it is a perfecting of that trust with which God attempts to teach us and to impart to us throughout all of life. Perseverance is the discipline by which God enables us to experience the greatest of sanctifications. Perseverance, looking at God, having hope, and keeping our focus on Him is the very it is the very discipline is the very habit that allows us to grow closer with god than anything else because if we don't have our eyes on god doesn't matter how often we're reading the bible doesn't matter how often we're in the church it doesn't matter how many fridays we show up in this building at nine o'clock at night and go till who knows if we don't have our eyes on God, none of that is worth anything. Because if our eyes are on God, we're doing it in pursuit of some sort of idol, rather than in pursuit of the God who chose to save us. And that's the thing. We have, we have to keep our eyes on God. We have to ensure that our hope stays true to the promise we have been given. And that's the whole point of today. That's, that's the whole point of this talk. If you get anything at all from the discussions and from this, is that we need to keep our eyes fixed on Jesus. Because if they aren't fixed on Jesus, 
we've missed everything.